things to do before we start theory itself. Um, we divided unemployment into three types, and this is sort of notional in our heads. People do try to measure this sort of thing and estimate what it is, but for our point of view here, we're really thinking of it as just sort of how we think about these things. Right? And so we have frictional unemployment that it just takes a while to find a job and takes a while to match people with work. We have structural unemployment where there's something fundamentally wrong in the economy about the skills versus the mismatch. And then there's cyclical unemployment, which is what we care about here, which is just the ups and downs in the business cycle. Some years are good, some years are bad. That's what we're hoping to explain here. Okay. Okay. If we just have, have just counting everything except for cyclical unemployment, we're calling that the natural rate of unemployment. There is nothing natural about that, but you should think 3%, 4%, but you know, it's vague because it's a notional thing. But there's a certain amount of unemployment that you would expect to see in the economy, even if there wasn't a, a business cycle. Right? So there's nothing natural about it. It is just the normal level of unemployment. Just like potential output wasn't really our potential, it was the normal level of output the natural rate of unemployment is just the normal level of unemployment. We would like to lower that, but it's not what we're discussing in the class. We're talking about the business cycle part of unemployment in the class. Okay. Yeah, yeah. And you, know, you can call the natural rate of unemployment U star and you get the same sort of thing. It just reflects the output gap. All right. There we go. Okay. Now we get to start theory. And the first thing I want to do is I want to talk about what the goal of doing economic theory is. And in fact, theory in most social sciences, and I would even say a lot of theory in physical sciences matches this, but social sciences in particular. So we're going to think about social sciences. Why do we do theory? What are we trying to get out of this? Because otherwise, we'll go through and do it, and you'll learn all the, the models and all that, but you won't really understand why you're doing it, and it will just feel stupid. And you will be right. But it actually has a purpose, and the stupidity is by design, not by, by accident, and so you should be aware of that. Um, this section is the no computer section, the Luddite section over here, so if you want to use your computer, you find another section. They try to keep that. Um, okay, so what are we trying to do? Well, our basic problem is that the world is really, really complicated, and it's complicated in a way that we can honestly never hope to fully understand it. We are never going to understand the economy. We are never going to understand group interactions. We are never going to fully understand the psychology of one human being. But these are beyond our ability to understand fully. Um, so for example, let's take something much simpler than say, the market for shoes or something like that. Let's just look at a game of chess. Right? A game of chess is really structured compared to any human interaction, much less the economy as a whole. Right? Any kind of human interaction is far more complicated than chess because chess has well-defined moves. You move your piece from here to there or from here to some other place, but there's just, you know, there's not sort of a gradient of inflections that you can put on the statement that you, there's no body language, there's none of this complication that comes when you deal with real human beings. It's just, you make this move, you make that move, and we get to have an order. I'm going to move, then you're going to move. Then I'm going to move, then you're going to move. And we know what victory looks like, so we know exactly what everyone's goals are. If we're honest with ourselves, I think, we don't even know what our own goals are. Right? We have some things. But there's lots of other things we want to, and it's complicated, and a human being is a difficult thing to understand, and that's just us ourselves, much less the whole world. So you take chess with all this structure, there's definitely going to be an end to it. We cannot solve chess. We, we do not fully understand this very structured, rigid game. And not only that, we cannot understand. We start like, thinking about what, how many reasonable games of chess are there. There are so many that we are never going to be able to grasp that. Like, um, so 
Chess is very unlikely to be fully understood. Computers are obviously really good at playing chess, but they don't fully understand chess either. They're using heuristics themselves. They don't have not fully solved that. They have not fully understood that. They are not certain that this line of attack is going to lead to a win. They just feel like it's better, just like a human player does, only, you know, better. Okay. So we don't understand chess. So how do we, how do we deal with that? Well, let's, let's think about chess. Let's suppose we wanted to understand chess, and we wanted to learn something about chess. Clearly, you could play a lot of chess, and you could, like, be, would not be, be, you know, bad to have Marcus Carlson come in here and explain to us about chess. He probably knows a thing about, to or about chess, right? So we could, if we're thinking about looking at the economy, we could interview people who have been in the economy, people who have run large corporations, people who have run small corporations, people who have bought stuff. Right? We could interview them and we could learn stuff from them. Right? People who are, are very good at this, maybe we could learn stuff from them. That's, that's useful. Right? Another way we could do it is we try to get sort of a, a handle on what's going on. We could think about a simpler problem. Okay? And so let's talk about chess. What is a simpler problem? Well, one of the things that we see in real life is that when you're new at chess, somebody wins, somebody loses. Somebody wins, somebody loses. Somebody wins, somebody loses. But as you go higher and higher in the rankings, there's more and more and more draws. Right? How do we understand that? Well, we can take a, a model of chess. Okay? And what we're looking for when we're doing a model is something that's simple enough that we can understand it. Right? Because our basic problem is we have this problem that is more complicated than we can understand. And we can understand some things about it, but we're not certain we're right because we haven't totally solved that thing. Right? We think, OK, when we play with everybody, this is kind of how it works out. But maybe that's because everyone's playing wrong. Because we don't know what right is in chess. right? So, we're doing the best we can. Um, and so what we want is we want to simplify things down to something that we can understand, really understand that, and then maybe take that by analogy to the more realistic, complicated thing. Right? So we want something that captures the essence of the problem, and the essence is, is problematic. You can guess yeah, so there's, there's more than one way to think about any problem, but we want to sort of distill something that captures something real about the problem but is still simple enough for us to understand. Right. So in the case of, of chess, we can think about tic-tac-toe, right? knots and crosses. This is a game that has a lot of features in chess, uh, that chess does. Right? There's an order to moves. I move, then you move. I move, then you move. There's a very a lot of structure to the game. Right? There's, like, there's only certain things that you can do in a move. Obviously, it's much less complicated than chess, but it has some of those same features. And you know, as a kid, you played it for a little while against your big brother or sister, and they were like rolling their eyes, and you were having the time of your life until you figured out the game, right? And then once you figured out the game, it was boring and nobody wants to play. Because if you play well, it's always a draw, right? Because you can solve it out. Yeah. And so you may buy this analogy to chess. You may not buy this analogy to chess. That's perfectly fair either way. But you can see that it has some features that are similar to the more complicated game. It has lots of features. Uh, the complicated game has lots of features that aren't in tic-tac-toe. But it has some features that are the same. And to the extent that you think that these features are important in the bigger game, in chess, then it might be a useful analogy. Right? And we might learn something from a more complicated game with this smaller game that we can actually solve. Okay? Now, I can also give you very bad analogies. You may think this is a very bad analogy. Right? So I'm, I'm trying to get something that's easy enough for me to understand, but also is capturing the essence of the problem. And maybe you think, you know, this doesn't capture the essence of the problem at all, in which case, this is not a useful model for you. But if I do this well, and I do this with some art, then maybe I can capture some essence of the problem with this simpler thing that I can actually understand. Okay. So what we're going to do is we're going to look at reality. And reality is like infinitely messy, right? Far more messy than any game we can, can, can do like chess. It is far more messy. There's millions of people interacting in complicated ways in weird institutions. And everyone's got their weird motivations. And everybody is slightly crazy, a lot of us more so. 
And the, you know, we're all got our thing, and we're all interacting in complicated ways. What do we do with this? How do we understand this? How do we learn anything about society when we know at the outset that we cannot fully understand it? Because right? we, we can't fully understand chess, and chess is part of the larger society, so, so clearly we're not going to be able to, to do it. Right? In order to fully understand the larger society, we have to know who's going to win the next game of chess, but we don't know that, so that there's, you know, because that's part of it. We're, we're clearly never going to understand the full thing. How do we go about that? Okay. Well, what we're going to do is we're going to try to pay, to like think that lots of things matter in the world. Loads of things matter in the world, and they really honestly do matter, but we're going to ignore most of them. And we're going to try to pick one or two things that we think are crucial, that are sort of core of some kind of story, and we're going to build a little fake world where those are the only thing that matters. So we're going to pretend like none of the other stuff matters, and then we're going to study the heck out of that little fake world until we understand what's going on with those aspects of the world that we chose to put in. Okay? And so there's an art and a science to this, right? We have to, artistically, we have to like say, this is the aspect of the world that I think is important. And we're picking and choosing there. And we, we can choose wrong, and we can choose foolishly, and we can choose in ways that aren't useful. But if we can pick something good that's sort of capturing something real about the world, and make a little story about it that we can fully understand, then the science bit is coming into like, how do you fully understand this little toy thing. Right? And then when you understand it, if you were good at picking which things to, to pick and choose from the world, maybe you fully understand, maybe, not fully understand, maybe you understand them better. You'll never fully understand them, but maybe you understand that aspect of the world better, and that can be useful. Right? By looking at this toy thing, we can learn something about, about the real thing, if we do it well. And doing it well is vague, and you may think, this one is, this model is good or this model is bad, it, it's useful or it's not useful. And that's a judgment call, right? Because it's about, did we capture an aspect of reality that's important? And did we learn something real about it with our little toy thing? Okay. 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 Then once we've learned about that little bit, that little aspect of reality, then we would go in and we would say, okay, we, we understand that bit. Obviously, we left out loads of things that are important. Let's bring in one or more of other things in to make it more realistic. Okay. Okay. So one of the common complaints that, that I want to blame students, because obviously we blame students for everything. But you know, as a person new to economics or to social science in general, a very reasonable complaint about what we do is that it's not realistic. Right? We made a goofy little model and we left out loads of things, it's not realistic at all. The assumptions of the thing are kind of dumb, and you are not wrong when you say that. That's obviously true. It is by design. Right? We are purposely leaving out lots of things in the world so that we can understand some things really well. So saying that this model is unrealistic is not wrong, but it's not helpful either. Right? Because we're trying to figure out what can we really fully understand and then bring it on. So, and this is not just, by the way, students. I blame students because you can't fight back. But in fact, you know, a lot of empirical economists that really haven't done theory or spent a lot of time with theory tend to have the same impression. That hey, it's fine, but it's not realistic. Let's, let, we want to look at the real world. And the point of it is to be unrealistic. So being unrealistic is a feature, it's not a bug. Okay. Now you may not agree with the approach, but if, if you're going down that approach, you want something unrealistic, because you cannot fully understand reality, maybe you can understand that little bit. Okay, okay. so here's, here's George Box, who, I don't know. I never met George Box, um, he's a, a famous econometrician, so he's an empirical guy. Um, but he's an econometrician, so he's doing the math behind the empirical stuff. Um, I, I like the picture. He looks kind of kind of nice. I feel like, yeah, I should have met him. It's a, it's a thing. Anyway, George Box, um, 
all models are wrong, some models are useful. So saying the model is wrong, neither here nor there, is it useful, does it help you understand something about reality? That's, that's what we want to talk about. And he's, of course, talking about empirical models, right? So when you're dealing with data where you're supposed to be taking in everything in reality, even then, everything is wrong. It's just how useful is it? Other issues in econometrics class, you'll, you'll see that kind of, kind of issue. But for here, for theory, we are by design setting up something that we know is wrong. But we're hoping it's right in one or two ways, and we can learn about those one or two ways by studying the heck out of it. Okay? And then adding more. Right? Okay. So our first macroeconomic model. And this is going to be the dumbest model that I can come up with. And I'm going to, to come up with it. Well, I am. Um, John Maynard Keynes in the 30s um, came up with this. He is, of course, very, very smart. And so, but it is still the dumbest model you can come up with. It is the simplest, simplest macroeconomic model that I can possibly come up with. Okay? Keynes did it for me, but still, it's, it's really, really simple. It is laughably silly. And yet, I'm going to argue, you may agree, you may disagree, that it captures something real, and then we can add on to that and make it more complicated, more interesting, more realistic. But first, we want to do it as simple as possible to try to understand something well and then add to it. And this, as I say, is the general approach. Okay? Normally, we don't make them quite this simple, but the general approach is simplify it as much as you possibly can, understand that bit, and then add on, right? Okay, so our first macroeconomic model is the Keynesian model, also known as the Keynesian cross diagram. I put the AKA up there so that if you have a different book, you can find it, it is there. Uh, if it's the introductory macroeconomics book, you will find this model. It is core for macroeconomics. It is sort of what not everything, but lots of stuff is built on. And if you don't understand this, you're not a macroeconomist. So it is just, just, yeah, it's a, it's a thing. All right, this is a model, though, that was developed to, to explain the Great Depression. Right, so this is a model that was made for a reason. Right? And the reason was they were going along, and all of a sudden, everything was fine, and then all of a sudden, everybody's out of work, the factories are empty, people are going around long lines waiting for, for work and you know, unemployment, people migrating, looking for work from here to there, they can't find work. It's a situation where you have lots of potentially productive resources. You have factories, you have workers. You have factories are empty, the workers are, are on their own, like loads of them. And yet we're not matching those up. The people want work, there's a factory they could work in. Why are these things not coming together? Why do we have this recession? And it was global recession. And it goes on and on and on and on. Why does it not just sort itself out? Right? What, you know, I want to work. You've got, got a factory. Like, let's, let's make a deal there. That, that seems reasonable. And so the question is, why did, was it not? And so that's the starting point of this, this model. Um, now, the assumptions that are going into this model, the way that we're simplifying the complicated world, is based on this reality of the time. So they were silliest assumptions then, but they are sillier assumptions now because we're not, thank God, in a, in a Great Depression. But the things we learn from the model are still, I think, fairly general and, and carry over to, to normal times. But start out thinking about it as a Great Depression sort of model. Like, this is the point of it. And so, it's easier to swallow. It's still oversimplifying the world always, but it's easier to swallow if you're thinking Great Depression, which is the appropriate way to be thinking, because that's what it was made for. Why does this not want to follow me? Okay. Okay. So, our story is going to be, just so you see where we're going, that in the short run, people might not want to buy stuff. And if we don't want to buy stuff, it's all well and good that we have a factory and we have a worker. But if we made the stuff, nobody would buy it. Right? And so the reason why the workers don't get jobs in the factory and the factory doesn't hire more workers is because there's nobody to buy the product when you're done. And so why bother? Right? And so it's going to be demand being very low 
that it's going to cause recessions, that it's going to cause us to have unemployment. All of this stuff is going to become, be coming about because demand is low. Okay. And this had policy implications. The way to deal with that then is to get demand up, right? To start buying more stuff. That would put people back to work. They would have money and they would buy stuff and it would get out of this vicious circle. So that's going to be the, the output. Okay. All right. So that, that's where we're going. And now we're going to have the assumptions. And we're going to simplify almost everything. Like we're going to get rid of almost all the complication of the world. Again, this is by design. We want to make it as simple as we can possibly understand, simple as we possibly can, and still have a story. And of course, the art is simplifying it in a way that's useful. Okay, there we go. Our key assumptions. It is going to be assumed, and this is the key, you can, can play around with the other things, but this, this is really the key, that in the short run, firms meet the demand for their product at preset prices. So I'm gonna have an analogy. We're gonna think of this as being an economy that just produces haircuts, and that's all they do is cut hair. Little beard trimming on the side, but we're gonna ignore that. Okay. Mostly it's just cutting hair. Okay. And what happens is they go and they start and they post a price, 20 euros for a haircut. Okay. And that's the price. And then they wait at their shop and they see who comes. If somebody comes to the shop, they cut their hair. If nobody comes to the shop, they don't cut any hair. Okay. So, We've set the prices. We're not going to play around with the prices. We're not going to say, nobody's coming to my shop. Let me lower my price. I got a big line at my shop. Let me raise my price. We're not going to say any of that in the short run. And we're just going to say, price is 20. I'm just going to say, whoever wants it, whoever demands that product, I'm going to produce it for them. Okay? And you can see why, why I'm fond of haircuts, because that's how haircuts work, right? You, you, like you go by the shop and sometimes I got a line there and sometimes they don't and you know, you don't, nothing gets proof. And other things aren't that way, right? If you're thinking about computers, in real life they kind of make the computer first and then they see who buys it, right? So there's production before, you know, there's what we find out whether there's demand or not. Um, and so a lot of things, aren't that way, so the haircuts are nice to think about, but you can see that we're simplifying a lot of stuff, right? A lot of stuff in real life, like most stuff in real life, has this build it and they will come kind of nature, right? right? They hired a bunch of economists to, to teach university lectures, and then maybe students will come, maybe they won't, who can know, right? There, there's, there's certain things that get done before other things in real life, not happening here. That's because we got the haircut analogy. Okay. Okay. Now we're going to pretend like the whole world works that way. Clearly it doesn't, but we're hoping that it captures something. Okay. And you can think for yourself how much you think it's capturing as we go through. Right? All right. So we're going to meet demand for the product at preset prices. Now clearly in real life, if I had a barber shop, and for year after year after year, I had my price of 20 euros and nobody came to my shop, eventually I'm going to try either lowering my, my price or go out of business or something. I'm going to change something, right? But in our little world here, we're not going to change the price in the short run. And so the short run is going to be however long it takes me to change my price. And people disagree about how long this is. And one of the big arguments in macroeconomics, like those big philosophical camps on either side, they, they even got jargon. They got the, the, the saltwater people who think that prices take a long time to adjust, and they got the freshwater people who think that prices get adjusted really quickly. Freshwater being University of Chicago school, they're on the lake, and, and um, salt water being Harvard school, which are they're on the water, so you get the thing. It's like a, it's like a whole thing. Like macroeconomists love to, to have a schism and fight it out. But one of the major arguments in macroeconomics is about how quickly prices adjust. If you think that prices adjust really quickly, that as soon as people stop showing up at the shop, within a week it's gonna, they're going to change their price anyway, 
And so this is going to be kind of interesting but useless, right? Because prices are going to adjust really quickly. This is only going to work as long as prices are set and they're, they're fixed for a while. If you think, on the other hand, that it takes a while for prices to adjust, then this is going to be more relevant. Now, I will say, as you're thinking about this, and this is you are, you are allowed to have any opinion you want. Like, like, we can stop you. Like, it's a free country. Like, think what you want to think. But, like, as a professional economist, and to, to be in the economist society and get all the club benefits and the secret handshake and all of that, you can have any opinion you want on this one. You will have a bunch of Nobel Prize winners with you on it. Um, but just to give the, the prices take slow, a while to adjust crowd a little, little backing here, when we think prices, we have this metaphor of the barbershop. And the barbershop feels like if they didn't have any customers, I don't know, they probably changed their prices pretty, pretty quickly there, right? That, that seems, what, what pretty quickly means, I don't know. But, but remember that prices are more complicated than that in real life. Right? Prices include, for example, the price of labor. And so how much do workers cost is one of the prices in the economy. And that is arguably a slower thing to adjust. Like, it's certainly a slower thing to adjust in most cases than barbershop prices. Right? So we're going to use the barbershop analogy, but we want to bear in mind that for prices to really adjust, all this stuff has to change. And in particular, wages. And in particular, since we're going to be using this to explain depressions and recessions, we're going to have a situation where demand is too low. And so we're at our barber shop, and nobody is coming. Right, and so we want to lower our price. But in particular, in order to get workers to show up, and we won't, we're not going to be in the model, but let's sort of have it in the back of your head. In order to get workers to, to work at the factory, we might have to lower the wages. To, in order to afford those workers, right? We're going to lower the price on our haircuts. We're probably going to have to lower our wages, too, to make that happen. That's one of the prices. Fine, but that is, in practice, a bit harder to do than lowering the price on the haircuts. Right? It's harder to do um, primarily because existing workers get pissed off about that. Right? And it's all well and good to say we're in having hard times and therefore we need to lower your wages, except firms are always saying we need to lower your wages. So that's nothing new. And so you know, they're the, the boy who cried wolf, they're always saying, oh, times are hard. I only got a 500 million bonus this year, so you have to work for less. They always say that. And so when it really becomes a thing, eh, yeah, right? who, 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 who buys it? Anyway, it is arguably, maybe, maybe true, maybe not, arguably a bit problematic to lower wages, right? And you can do it, of course. You can say, you take it or leave it, worker. But if they're disgruntled, they can cause a lot of damage. And you can have malicious compliance. Right? If you have an unhappy workforce, good things don't come from that often, right? Um, so all of a sudden, you have a different character of thing. You want people that are working and enthusiastic to be there and putting a little extra effort in and all that. And if they're disgruntled, you don't have that. So there can be problems lowering the wage, potentially. Right? Again, this is a, an area of intense argument in, in the literature. Right? So if prices take a while to adjust, this model is relevant to the extent that prices change really quickly this model is less relevant. Um, in particular, though, the model is still true in the sense that as long as prices are fixed, we are in the short run. So our definition of what means short run, what does that jargon mean? In this context of this model, it means however long it takes for prices to change. And again, we're thinking kind of all prices. Okay? We're going to have just barbershop in our story. But the amount of time it takes for all the prices in the economy to adjust when they're out of whack. OK, so we have our, our firms have set their prices. And this is going to drive me insane. Yeah. All right, now it finds me again. All right. Set their prices, and then they're just waiting for customers. And if a customer comes, they're going to serve them produces something, in this case a haircut, and if they don't, they don't. Another way to think about it, it because you want to think about the flaws in the model as well, um, and 
hopefully, as you're going through, you're arguing with this and you're saying, do I buy this crap or not? And you are perfectly allowed to not, right? So you should, should be thinking, like, what are these assumptions and how do they capture something real or don't they, right? And so far, or, eh, kind of thin ice, right? Um, what was I gonna say? Ah, we can have another analogy if we think about products not being services. But remember, our economy is about two-thirds services, one-third one -third physical things. And there's a lot when you like, go and buy something. There's a lot of service involved in getting that thing to you, the shippers and the packers and the you know, guys who put it on the shelf and all that services that you're buying when you buy a physical product as well. All right, but if you want another analogy, you can imagine like you're going going for coffee in the morning and you go to, what, Super K now. Super K, you go to the Super K and you go in and you push the button and it makes the coffee, right? And so you're buying a physical thing, but it's not really made until you come and you buy the product, okay? Which is unlike, say, a TV where they made the TV and then they saw whether you came, okay? So we want, really want something in our analogy where the production only happens after you say you want it, okay? If we're gonna be literal. Of course, this was all done in the 1930s when services were a much smaller portion of the, com of the economy and, and this coffee on demand thing was ridiculous and nobody was gonna think. So, you know, it's, it's not that we literally have to have this as the way that it works, because it doesn't always work this way, but we're kind of thinking that, of that as an analogy. So this is one of the ways that we are unrealistically simplifying the world to get rid of that, first they produce it, then we see whether anyone buys it, kind of thing. Okay. All right. okay, so our story for why prices don't adjust, and this is, you can, you can have any story you like, but, but the primary one we think of is menu costs. And this is, this is from the old school, you guys wouldn't know. You're all young, well, most of you. Well, some of you all have seen this world. There used to be a day I know it's hard to believe, where they would print up menus at a restaurant and they would have prices on the menu. You didn't have to use your phone or nothing. You could just, they would give you a piece of paper. And it was, it was amazing. And then if we go back even farther, like to from before my time, um, but we're back in Keynes's time, that you couldn't just get your laser printer to print out those menus, but you actually had to go to an actual print shop and actual humans would typeset the thing and then they'd have a big thing. And so it was like a big deal to print a menu. It was like undoable, but it was a real cost that firms would bear just to print a menu. And nowadays, it's not so much a thing, right? But so the, the jargon is it's costly to change your prices. And in this story, in sort of the original story, it was you got to print up the menu, which involves printers and ink and giant machines and, and all of that in a way. Obviously, does it today. Um, and so that was sort of the in our initial analogy. And so if it's costly to change your menu, then even if your price is a little out of whack, say I, I'm charging 20 euros for my haircuts, it really should be 1998. It's not worth producing the menu for that two cent difference, right? And so your, your, your price would have to be really out of whack before it was worth doing. Now, Obviously, this isn't really a thing these days, this menu cost thing in sort of the literal sense, but the jargon is still menu cost. And in fact, even back in the day, back in the, day the printing of the menu was honestly a minor cost. Like it was a thing, but it wasn't like the major reason why people didn't adjust their prices. We want to think about it in a more abstract way. Even if you were in the 30s, you wanted to think about it in a more abstract way. It's just costly to change your prices. And that's just sort of a analogy rather than a, a thing. So what makes it costly to, to change your prices? So suppose I'm selling a bunch of computers. We, we're moving you know, 200 million units a day and it's just not going well and then I think, okay, our prices are wrong. We need to, to change the price. Now, the way I'm talking about it, just change the price. But it's not how the corporate world works, right? You, can't, you don't have anyone that just changes the price in the morning. You have somebody who puts a, uh, any other business memo on the meeting. Uh, the meeting's coming up, I put any other business, let's talk about the price. 
Okay, let's talk about the price. And we discuss the price, and some people say it's too high, and some people say it's too low. We find, I don't care. Like, and then we have, to, okay, let's have some market research, and we bring in some guys that discuss the price, and they get a bunch of consumers, and we line them up and say, how do you think? Do you think the price is too high? I think the price is too high. The rent is too damn high. Obviously it is. And then we, we well, but yeah, but would you really buy it, even if we had it? Right, and we have a big discussion, and then we have to fight it out in the boardroom, and someone has to meet, and somebody, has to go out on the limb and say we're changing the price. And you know, in corporate, it's not so easy to get someone to go out on a limb. And so the whole thing takes time and effort, and it's just a royal pain in the butt. Um, can be done. It's not like it's printing the menu is the problem, but it's like a process. Any bureaucracy, everything's a process. And so it is costly in that sense. And because it is costly in that sense, yeah, don't do it every day. Okay? That's one reason. Another reason is that consumers absolutely hate it when you're changing the price every day. Right? So it's all well and good to say we can change the price every day, we got a website, but when they checked for your price yesterday and then they come back today and it's higher, they are pissed. Right? Um, now some, some companies, have, some industries have gone that way. Airline industry, my God. Right? They're changing the price every minute. They got a different price for you. And if you use Chrome web browser, you get a lower price than you use Firefox. And the whole thing's a nightmare. Um, but you'll notice that we all think it's a nightmare. Right? We're not happy with that. It's just, what can you do? Right? They're doing what they're doing. But most industries, consumers really don't like it. And if you're in a competitive industry, you don't really want to be pissing off your consumers all the time. And so this is one of the things you try to avoid changing your prices too often, just so you don't piss off the consumers. This also is a menu cost. No literal menus involved, but there's a cost to doing this thing. Okay? And because there's a cost of doing this thing, changing the prices, we tend not to do it unless they're really, really out of whack. And so we can have prices fixed in the short term which is our story. Okay, how we do? Okay. 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 So we are going to have um, this thing. Our basic story is that recessions come because people aren't buying enough. So to tell this story, first thing we need to do is we need to say, well, what are people buying? Right? Our core thing for this story, the core thing that we're simplifying all the complications of the world down to one thing that we're trying to capture. And that one thing that we're trying to capture is how much stuff are people buying? And so we can simplify everything. We're going to ignore everything. All the complications of the world are going to go away. But that's our core story. And we have to tell that story. All right, so planned aggregate expenditure. How much do we plan to spend? That's going to be the core of this story. Okay? Prices are set. We know what the price of the haircut is. And now we just say, how many haircuts do you want, bud? And he decides how many hairs to get cut. Seven hairs, please. Okay. okay. Planned expenditure on final goods and services is called planned aggregate expenditure. There you go. And it is just C plus I plus G plus net exports. We have seen that before. That's just GDP, is it not? The only difference from GDP, and it is exactly the same, is that I got a little P here for investment. Um, so this is going to be the amount of investment that we plan on making. Okay. Everything else is just exactly as it was before. It's just GDP. It's just how much do consumers want? How much do firms want? How much do, does the government want? How much do foreigners want? And then we subtract off the imports, right? exports minus imports, because we, do, we don't care about how much the consumers want of Irish stuff. But of course, consumers don't care where it comes from, and so, or even know. And so we need to subtract off the imports. Okay? So the only thing that's different from what we've seen before is that we're thinking of this, first of all, just as expenditure, right? whereas we know that there's three ways to think about a sandwich, the amount spent on it, the income gained from it, and the value of the sandwich itself. And now, of those three, we're just thinking about it as expenditure. Okay? But we know that they're equal to the other things. It's just, now we're just thinking, how much do people buy? Okay? C plus I for G plus net exports. Sadly, and this is really sad, um, I have memorized that. And I'm afraid, and I'm, now, don't strike, 
tattoo it on anything because you, you don't need the tattoo, you'll know. It, we're going to use this C plus I plus G plus net exports over and over and over again. Um, don't. Like, it's, 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 you, you will know it without trying to memorize it. You will know it by the end. It is just, yeah, consumers, firms, government, foreigners, right? All the people who could buy our stuff. Again, the one difference, well, again, let me talk about it properly now, is planned investment is not investment, is planned investment. And that's because what we're doing here is we're coming up with a story for why people are buying stuff. Right? Because our story is going to be people aren't buying enough stuff to support full employment. Right? And so it has to be a story about why people are buying. And investment has a stuff that you intended to do, but it also has some stuff that you never intended to do. So for example, I'm running a firm, not a haircutting firm, it's a chocolate firm. And I think for Valentine's Day, people are going to buy lots and lots of chocolate. So at the end of last year, I produced a whole lot of chocolate. These are my inventories of chocolate. And then we go into Valentine's Day. I'm expecting to go down to 100 crates of chocolate. Right? But way more chocolate got purchased than I thought, and I'm down to 50 crates. Right? So I intended to invest 100 in inventory. But in fact, I only invested 50 in inventory, right? because inventory is part of my investment. And so because demand might be higher or lower than I expected, I might be left with more or less inventories than I expected. And so that counts in GDP, but we don't really want to count it here because we want to be looking at how much do they want to buy? How many crates of chocolate does this firm want to hold in reserve as inventory? Right? And that, what they end up with might be higher or lower than what they expected. In GDP, that counts for, for GDP, but we don't really want to be talking about that because now we're in the world of theory, we're not in the world of measurement. Right? Before we were trying to measure how much stuff got produced. Here we're trying to figure out how much do people want to produce, okay? which is almost the same, but not quite. Now that said, we're not going to make any big deal about this planned investment here in this class. You can just think about it, investment, you're fine for this class. But it is a thing, that, that we're, and the reason we're making the difference is because we're doing a different thing now. There's nothing like, like cast in stone about this C plus I plus G plus net exports. We use it all the time, but it is just a way to divide things up to help us think about it. We could be using the brown hair, the blonde, and the red haired people just as easily. It would just be less useful. Right? This is just a way of thinking about it. And what we want to think about now is how much people plan to buy. And so planned investment is the part we want. So it's almost GDP, just not quite. Okay. Okay. Right. So we need a story. So the whole thing is going to be. We have, this is how much people want to buy, C plus I plus G is net export, the usual thing. Um, that's how much people want to buy. But we need a story for why, right? Because a theory is a story to help us understand the world. We're making a very simple little parable sort of story. Like, a, like little red riding hood level. So a girl goes out, takes a basket, doesn't take the basket, eat by a wolf, that kind of thing, right? It's going to be a very simple story that's going to help, help to teach us something. But we need a character in our story. We need people doing things for a reason. Because if we just want to measure, we don't care the reason. We just go out and we find out how much it is. Right? And we're done. But here we want to understand it, so we need a reason why people are behaving in the way they do. And so we have this thing. This is how much they want to buy. And our story is going to be that they don't want to buy enough to support full employment, to support the normal level of output. But why not? Right? So we need a story about why they want to buy. Okay? And where we're going to put our story, our initial story, is on consumption. We're going to have a story about why consumers want to buy stuff. Right? It's going to be a very simple story. It's not going to like get into their deep in the super ego or anything like that. It's just going to be real, really simple. You got more money, you want to buy more stuff. You got less money, you want to buy less stuff. There's going to be that kind of story. Very, very, very simple to start out with. But it's going to be a story about why they want to buy. Okay? We could and we will attach stories to other things. Why do firms want to invest? 
When do they invest more? When do they invest less? These are important questions. But we are, again, starting our model out as simple as we can make it. So yes, we could tell stories about investment. We could even tell stories about foreigners, about the exchange rates and the incomes in their countries and, and stuff like that. Um, but we're not going to start out. We're going to start out as simple as we can make it. So we're going to have one simplest story that we possibly can. Okay? Here, we're deliberately leaving out important things. Right? That's, that's the exercise. Leave out almost everything in the world and just focus in on one thing. So the one thing that we're going to focus in is how much do consumers want to buy? Okay. By the way, if, if you think back to what I said a few lectures ago, this is a little bit problematic in the sense that we said, okay, consumption makes up a big, big chunk of GDP. Investment makes up a smaller chunk of GDP, right? But investment changes a lot year to year. Consumption doesn't actually change that much year to year. So if we looked at really where do, we, do recessions come from, well, the part that varies a lot year to year is probably a better candidate to thinking about business cycles than the part that doesn't change much year to year. Right? So I'm going to be focusing on business cycles come from consumption. But if we look at, at data, we know that investment is much more volatile than consumption. So maybe we should be focusing on investment as the source of, of, of business cycles rather than consumption. On the other hand, consumption is big, investment is small, and so focusing on this big thing is maybe a thing. Again, we have a model that was made for the Great Depression, and so in the Great Depression, you have investment vanished, but also consumption fell a lot, right? Because everybody, even if you had a job, you were very, very worried about losing that job, and so you did zero luxury spending. You tried to save as much as you could, and so consumption actually did fall quite dramatically. And so it was a reasonable place to start for the Great Depression, maybe less so for our run-of-the-mill business cycles. Because in run-of-the-mill business cycles these days, consumption doesn't vary that much. Right? But anyway, we're focusing on consumption. That's going to be our story. And we're going to see where that takes us. And we'll add to it. OK. okay. So the way we're going to do this is we're going to have a consumption function. And I know the math phobic among you will see the world, world word function and say, oh, God bless. I wonder if it's too late to change classes. Um, it won't be that bad, but it is yeah, technically a function. And this is the jargon, so we will call it a consumption function. It's just going to say, when do people consume a lot and when do they consume a little? And it's going to be a very simple story about when people consume more and when they consume less. And our story is going to be that, in particular, the thing people, you know, why do people consume more? Lots of reasons. Some people are independently wealthy, and they just buy stuff because, you know, they say, yeah, why not get it? And, and some people are, are, have no assets or are deep in debt, and they consume less because they got to pay back their debts. But as an economy as a whole, our story is going to be that if you have high income, you are going to tend to consume more than if you have low income. Okay, so this is a deep, deep, meaningful, we've really got it, the psychology of a consumer. But we can all see that reflected in our own life. Can we not? When you have a higher income, you tend to buy more stuff than when you have a low income. Maybe not all of you, but most of us most of the time. High income, I spend more. Low income, I spend less. Other things do matter, but that is one of the things that I think, I don't know that I've ever had anyone like, feel like this is really controversial. Maybe you do. Like, you're allowed to. But, but I, I, I think, think that's reasonably non-controversial. Like, if you have a higher income, you spend more. Lower income, you spend less. That's going to be our story. We're going to have the barbershop with the preset prices. Consumers, high income consumers, they spend more. Low income consumers, they spend less. Okay, I'll let you go, and we'll continue that next time.